as the talk for you this, this afternoon. Enjoy. Hello. So, so I'm here to talk about DRBD and its abuse for low downtime multi terabyte database migrations. Um, I'd like to tell you more or less what um, Nathan just told you. Um, I'm a sysadmin at Anchor. Um, I work with Jay, who was just in here talking about containers before lunch. Um, and I'm an occasional open source contributor, mostly bug fixes and so forth, but I'm mainly a sysadmin. OK, the, the, I'm not going to assume people know about the technologies that I'm talking about, so I'm going to give a brief introduction first. Um, first of all, DRBD stands for Distributed Replicated Block Device. Um, it's basically RAID 1 across a network, um, operates over TCP, and DRBD 8, which is the current stable release, only lets you replicate between two nodes. Um, DRBD 9 is going to let you do more interesting things with multiple nodes, but it's not stable yet, so it's not really relevant to production usage. And it supports both synchronous and asynchronous replication, so you can either have um, writes need to go to both nodes before you actually get a successful write back, or you can have um, the write to the remote node go asynchronously in the background. Uh, what is Pacemaker? It's not that central to the talk, but I'll talk about it anyway. It's a high availability cluster resource manager. Um, it handles the stopping and starting of resources in the cluster according to whatever policy the sysadmin defines. Um, and it's also responsible for fencing um, in a cluster where you're using Pacemaker. Um, what is Pocona? Pocona is a relational database server based on MySQL. It's um, what we happen to be using in this case, it's not um, that important to the procedure. The procedure is using DRBD, so it'll use anything that... Um, I I've put down here which source is started on a file system. Technically, all you really need is a block device, but most block devices will have file systems. And it has built-in support for replication, um, which uses binary logging to write down the changes it needs to make on disk. Um, in order to replicate them. And I bring this up because I'm going to talk about why we looked at that um, as a possible solution for our problem and why it wasn't appropriate. So having, having talked about the technologies in use, um, the problem we're facing is, to begin with, we were managing a very large, about three terabyte um, Pocona server instance um, on a two-node two HA cluster with DRBD and Pacemaker. Um, the Pocona data was, of course, on a volume which DRBD was replicating. The problem that we found was the Pocona database was rapidly approaching the storage capacity of the hardware, which couldn't be extended because it was already full of disks. Um, and so we'd, ob we'd obtained a new pair of machines for a replacement cluster, got Pacemaker and DRBD set up there, and this talk, the rest of this talk is going to be about the way that we um, came up with to move the data from the old cluster onto the new cluster. Okay, so the obvious solution to this would be to use Pocona's built-in replication. Um, unfortunately, we had tried to do Pocona replication a few months prior um, as a means for doing backups. Um, it turns out that due to the very heavy um, write activity on this particular server instance, um, if you enable binary logging to do replication, um, what binary logging effectively does is, in addition to writing the data out to the database itself, it keeps a log of it on disk. And adding that additional <coughs> write um, for each query that needs to be replicated um, slowed down performance to the point where it was not usable because we had so many writes hitting the server. Um, so we already knew from the outset that Pocona replication was not going to work um, because we couldn't turn on binary logging that was necessary for it. Um, so we thought we're using DRBD already um, out for data replication within the cluster. Can we leverage DRBD to transport the data from one cluster to another? Um, it, it's, DRBD is integrated into the Linux IO stack, so writes don't, uh, unlike with Pocona replication where the writes need to be logged separately for replication. Um, DRBD gets the write, writes it to disk, and also writes it across a network. Um, 
so the, there's less I/O activity required um, to replicate that data. Um, there is still some additional I/O since it needs for the initial sync. It will need to read from the disk, but nowhere near as much as with Pocono replication. Um, and so the initial plan we came up with was we have a pair of HA nodes in the cluster. Um, let's break that DRBD link um, and then form a new DRBD link between the node running Pocona and the new Pocona master to migrate the data, um, which would have worked. But we, um, the issue with doing that is with a three terabyte data set, the initial sync for your data takes quite a long time. If we'd broken the HA link in order to start the replication um, in that manner, we would have gone more than a week without HA once you add up the initial data sync to the new cluster, um, doing testing to make sure that things aren't going to explode when you actually cut over. And then once you have cut over, you then need to do an initial sync to the standby node of the new cluster. And once you add all that up, it adds up to more than a week without high availability. And part of the service that was being provided was high availability Pocona. So we couldn't do that because we couldn't justify having more than a week um, with no HA during the migration. So what we wanted to do was come up with a solution based on this idea, but that allowed us to preserve high, avail high availability for as much time as possible. At which point I turned to the DRBD user's guide, um, which is very complete and has a lot of information on um, how to use DRBD. And one of the, um, one of the things it suggests is using stacked DRBD, where you have um, multiple, um, as I said before, DRBD 8 can only replicate between a pair of nodes. So if you want replication between more than two nodes, you need a DRBD resource and then another one stacked on top of it. Um, and the documentation um, describes quite clearly how you can do this with four nodes, which is what we had, two nodes of two clusters each. Um, but the use cases in the user's guide were not quite the same as ours. So th this provided a starting point for us. Um, and this diagram illustrates how stacked DRBD works. Um, the intent here is that you have the two lower level resources that um, you can have master slave either way. Um, and then if you say you wanted to fail over cluster one so that the left hand node was the master, the stacked resource on top would then replicate um, from that. And then you, you read directly from the block device exposed by the stacked resource. Um, and that would actually have done what we wanted if, because it replicates data from one master to three other nodes, that would have worked for, um, for our use case. With the caveat that because it requires stacking another resource on top of the existing one, um, as you will note, the resource in cluster one, which is what we had to start with, would need another resource stacked on top of it. We would have needed to um, unmount Pocona's file system, which requires a Pocona restart in order to stack that resource on top. Um, that takes a few minutes with a three terabyte data set, and we wanted to try and minimize the downtime as much as possible. Um, so I wanted to look for a solution that would let us um, effectively do what stacked DRBD is doing, but not, not require us to restart Pocona until we actually need to cut over. Um, and so I came up with an idea that I've called daisy chained DRBD, um, which is on the surface appears to be similar to stacked DRBD. It, um, it, would, it, it would allow us to keep running, um, keep, keep Pocona running right up until cutover. Um, and that's more or less what it looks like. So because the DRBD resource on cluster one is now at the top of the stack, uh, sorry, I should probably explain how the data is moving through these diagrams. Um, what, I've, what I'm basically... So on that, if you can just get into that. I'm a bit naive about how, you, how the data moves between the two nodes in the original HA, just okay. as you currently got it set up. So um, yeah, I'll just take a step back and explain that. So the question was how the data moves between the nodes in the original HA. Um, so basically what DRBD does is it's a layer in the Linux IO stack. Um, it exposes a block device in dev, so you have dev DRBD zero or whatever. 
um, you write to that, and DRBD says, OK, I've got some data. I'm going to both write that to my local disk and then send that over a TCP connection to the other node in the cluster, which also writes that to its disk. So, so when you're saying that you had a, a Hakona HA cluster, that already used DRBD to yes. provide the, 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 the replication? Okay. One of the most common ways of explaining DRBD is RAID 1 over the lab. I saw that, that just wasn't apparent. Well, I come from an Oracle background, and so we, we just have the instances do that directly as it's just possible. To yeah, this is at the file stack level, but no matter what application on the file, the data is all replicated, regardless of application. Okay, so the, the way I've got this represented here is that the um, data gets written in from the top, um, and this is basically a representation of the IO stack, so where you have a DLBD resource above another one, data gets written to the uppermost one first, um, and then on its way to disk, it passes through the lower layer of DRBD. So you can look at, you can think of this as being kind of like a waterfall of um, disk writes. It starts out on top and cascades down towards the right. Um, whereas with stacked DRBD, you kind of have it cascading down in both directions. And the, the reason this was suitable, this was the best fit for us, is because um, the resource that is on top is the one we are already using. So we didn't need to make any changes to the existing Pocona master that's running Pocona. It can just keep sitting there running Pocona while we're doing all this migration work in the background, and thus not need to take the server down. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Back up a little bit. Which of those, uh, which of those are synchronous and which are asynchronous of those errors? Okay, um, so the way we used it, the left and right hand ones are synchronous and the middle one is asynchronous. Um, I'm going to um, talk about how we implemented it for a specific okay, case later. Um, so, because they seem quite similar on the surface, I wanted to um, explain what I think the major defining differences are between these techniques. Um, so to begin with, a stacked configuration has all resources configured on all nodes. Um, and the reason for that is because um, you, the, this, um, because cluster one's lower DRBD <coughs> resource can flip around so that the left hand node is the master, um, every node needs to know that one or the other of those cluster one nodes, whichever one's the master for the lower resource, is then going to be the master for the upper one. Um, whereas with Daisy chained DRBD, you don't actually have it flipping back and forth in that fashion. Um, you're never going to be moving the master for the lower resource there across to the left. So th that left hand node, which is the one running per corner, doesn't need its DRBD configuration changed at all. It doesn't need to know or care about the fact that you're chaining additional resources onto it later. Um, and this ties into the second major difference. Um, which is that um, stacked, um, stacked DRBD assumes that you want to keep er every single node in sync regardless of which one is the master. Um, no matter which one of these four nodes is the master node at any given point, um, because the, the link connecting the two clusters is the one on top, um, any writes are going to propagate across to both clusters regardless of whether something in cluster one is the master or something in cluster two is the master. So this is a solution that um, is intended if you effectively have a cluster of four machines rather than two clusters of two machines. Um, so you can keep them all in sync. Um, however, with daisy chaining DLBD resources together, the only thing you really want is data flow in one direction. You want to get data from cluster one to cluster two and you never actually care about having data written onto cluster two, making it back to cluster one, because we're going to um, eventually then migrate to the new cluster and cluster one's going to be forgotten about. So they have very different use cases, and although they are similar in implementation, I don't think there's likely to be a lot of overlap in when they would be used. Okay, so before I talk about how we actually implemented this, um, I just want to take a moment to talk about um, a few other considerations we had to make. We wanted to make sure that Pacemaker and Puppet, our 
what we use for config management aren't making any changes at the same time people are making changes. If, if you start making changes to pacemaker managed resources manually while pacemaker thinks it's managing them, it will rightfully get quite angry with you because it'll, it's supposed to keep the cluster in a known consistent state. That's what it's there for. And if you make that state inconsistent with what pacemaker thinks, it will try and change it. Um, when you know what you're doing and you know that you're making changes that you want to be around, you want to tell pacemaker, please go into maintenance mode, don't do anything. And similarly with Puppet, if you're changing on config files. Um, so that's more kind of general wisdom if you're doing anything on HA clusters, but it's particularly important when you're adding new resources like new DRBD resources that the cluster doesn't even know about. Stephen, did you find out that the hard way? Um, <laughs> not in this particular case. Maybe when I was playing with this stuff ages ago, but I, um, it's, when I was doing this, I knew that pace, uh, Pacemaker would complain if I tried to take down the DRBD resource on the slave. Um, so the, the way DRBD does metadata, um, which is important for how we implemented it so that it didn't cause us a whole bunch of headaches, is <clears throat> you can do DRBD metadata in one of two ways. You can have it use internal metadata where you, you say this is the device that I want you to replicate and DRBD will reserve a section at the end of the device where it puts all its metadata and what you get replicated is the remainder of that device that's actually slightly smaller than um, what you gave it. Or you can use external metadata where you tell it, here's a device to replicate, here's a device for metadata, and it'll put all its metadata over there and only replicate that one device. So we typically use internal metadata for um, DOBD resources within clusters. Um, so we, we did this as normal for the new cluster that we provisioned. So um, on the diagram with cluster one and cluster two, both the internal links have internal metadata, um, but we made it slightly larger, we, we made the new cluster's volume slightly larger than the old one. The reason for this is, um, actually I have a diagram here that shows quite well. The reason for this is that to any lower layer in the DRBD chain, um, the metadata of an, the, the internal metadata of an upper layer is just data. So what you have at the top is a file system that uh, MySQL or Pocono is using. Um, and then cluster one's DRBD is, um, ha has its internal metadata. That's what we started with. We then wanted to push that down onto cluster two. There's no way to do that um, unless there's some something weird you could do with device mapper to make it show a smaller device or something. There's no real way that you can do that um, without also replicating cluster one's metadata, but that's no big deal because it's a fairly small part of the, part of the disk. So we had to make cluster two's volume larger so that it can accommodate both sets of metadata, only one of which it's actually using. We then configured a new DRBD resource between the old and new clusters. Um, for that, we used asynchronous replication. The reason being that if something went terribly, terribly wrong in the new cluster, which is not in production, we don't really care and we don't want it to affect what's going on in the old cluster at all. Um, and we use external metadata because the, um, because we were layering um, cluster one's original DRBD on top of the intercluster DRBD. We wanted the device that it exposed to have that metadata in the correct place. And the two ways we could have done that are to calculate precisely the size that DRBD is going to use for internal metadata, um, which is finicky and I didn't really want to do that. Or tell it just use external metadata and then you get exactly the same device out on top as you have underneath. And then um, the, the original DRBD can continue synchronizing as normal. So given, given that plan for how we do metadata, we um, first had to temporarily bring down the DRBD slave on the old cluster so we could insert a new layer underneath it. Um, th this comes back to what I was saying about restarting Pocona. Because we were layering a new DRBD resource underneath it, we could do it on the slave, as opposed to if we were doing stacked 
DRBD and putting, it on, putting the new resource on top, we would have to restart Pocona to get that to work. We had a resultant loss of HA for about 30 seconds. It's a few commands to bring down the resource, bring up the new one, and then, uh, and then bring up the existing one on a new backing store. And then we could re-enable Pacemaker on the old cluster, and it might seem non-obvious why, but Pacemaker doesn't really care about what backing store um, DRBD is using. Pacemaker is just told you have some DRBD resource, please manage it. So <coughs> once we had that middle link in place, we could tell Pacemaker, start managing things on cluster one again. Pacemaker doesn't even know that the middle link exists. All it sees is some DRBD resource backing onto some block device. Um, and so there's no problem with letting Pacemaker do its thing there because you, you're no longer making changes to the cluster. Are you going to talk about how you tested this? Yes, that's oh, coming up next. Go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, so some, um, some gotchas we had to look out for. Um, silent corruption is actually very, very easy when you're... Um, remember what I said about... Um, chaining DRBD resources together, you only care about the data moving in one direction. Um, because of that, anything that you write to the, vol the volume that's um, underlying DRBD um, on, the, on cluster two is not going to get replicated back to cluster one. So when testing, you have to be very, very careful about what you write to. Um, because as soon as you write anything to that, um, that volume, DRBD is not going to know to resync it. It doesn't have a way of telling that somebody's gone outside its sphere of influence and written stuff onto that volume. Um, the, the other... The, isn't the slide volume redundant? Um, okay, so what, I'm, what I mean by the underlying volume is the device that you're saying use this to replicate to. So DRBD, I believe, won't expose a block device for the volume it's managing, but there's nothing stopping you taking DRBD down, writing data yourself to whatever volume DRBD is writing to, and then starting it up again, and it'll have no idea that you've done that. Um, manually editing um, the DRBD configuration, which is what you need to do in this case, because it's something, it, it's not something you do often enough to be worthwhile trying to automate. So, Basically, you have two clusters, a total of four nodes, and each one of them has a different DRBD config because not every one of them knows about all the DRBD resources that every, oh, every other one does. So you kind of have to sanity check your config three or four times over to make sure that you have all the right ports and all the right um, backing volumes on all the right nodes because it's easy to get confused when you're dealing with uh, multiple different configs. So that, that's one big drawback of this method. Okay, for testing, um, I'm going to say it's desirable that writes done on the new cluster don't impact the consistency of the replicated data. The reason I say that it's desirable and not required is that technically you can write all you want to it and then just kick off another full sync, but that's going to take another couple of days or whatever, so you don't want to. Um, what we did to test was leave the, leave the volume, which happened to be on LVM, that. Um, that the OBD was writing to well alone, snapshot that, and start up Pocona on the snapshot. And then, of course, once you're done testing Pocona and you know everything works, um, you just throw the snapshot away and your origin volume is untouched and you know that it's, not, um, that it's consistent. You didn't consider using the checksums to verify that the size of the same? Um, well, the RBD is going to... Um, Yes, you could do that, but um, you'd have just to... Just as long as the sync. Sorry? It takes just as long as the sync. No, it doesn't take as long as the sync. If you do a verify, that takes just as long as the sync. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, the, the, other, the other thing I was going to mention with that is if you wanted to check some the, the data um, outside of DRBD itself, um, you'd need to make sure that you've got snapshots of the data that are consistent with each other at the same time because you're having data constantly written to the volume. Um, whereas I, I think it's reasonable to assume that um, if you haven't written anything to, to the origin LV that DRB is replicating to after you've done the initial sync, um, 
reasonable to assume that that's going to be consistent because the only thing that's ever written to it has been DRBD. Um, yeah, but so sorry, I've been forgetting to mention to, to uh, repeat the question. That um, that was to say that the um, you can just choose some key data sets to test. Um, if you can mount the file system on the snapshot and start Pocona, then it's um, at least clear that you don't have any particularly obvious corruption um, in any case. Um, and if, as I said, if, if nothing but DRBD has been writing to your volume, then um, it's quite unlikely that it's going to be corrupted unless you have disk issues or something along those lines. Um, so we did come across a minor problem when testing um, that we hadn't given the Pocona user the same UID on both nodes. So of course it didn't own its own files and couldn't start up. That, that's normally not worth mentioning, but I, I've given this its own slide because it um, illustrates the importance of testing this before cutting over, because if you did this, if you did the cut over and just thought everything's going to be fine because I know I have a, I have a consistent data set, um, then it would take you the same length of time to track down and fix this problem, but you'd be doing it while Pocona was down. Um, so testing is quite important. And we also did, I, I haven't made a slide about it because it's boring, but um, we also did do testing on an isolated cluster away from production before we made any changes on production so that we knew that the method was sound. So once we were ready, once we'd done all the testing and we were ready to cut over, um, first thing, of course, is to stop the Kona and unmount its file system so you no longer have anything writing to the, the DRBD resource. Um, I like to check that both DRBD resources are in sync just because um, if something unexpected happens and you find that you have a few blocks out when you cut off the replication, then again, you can get corruption. Um, or at the very least, out-of-datedness. Um, so you bring down the inter-cluster resource on the new master, so to go back to where I had the nice diagram, um, in order to be able to start Pocona on cluster two, you need to not have um, that DRBD link on top of it. Um, you don't need to stop it on cluster one because cluster one is just going to realize the connection is gone and wait for it to come back, and it'll never come back, but we don't care once we've moved to cluster two. Um, I've gone too far. Okay, and then you can, so once you have that inter-cluster inter resource taken down on cluster two, um, the cluster should now be in the state that Pacemaker wants it to be in. So you can turn off maintenance mode, tell Pacemaker, please start up Pocona, and everything should be hunky-dory. Um, if it's not, you can roll back at that point. Um, but as it turned out, everything was hunky-dory and um, went ahead. The total downtime Nigel's reported for this procedure was 10 minutes. That is basically the time taken to restart Pocona. Um, with a data set that's huge. Um, because we kept the block device in sync the entire time, there was no final sync in the end. We stopped Pocona, unmount the file system, mount up the file system and start it up again. So it's effectively just a failover between two clusters. Um, you can't get a short, shorter downtime window without trying to do something like live migrate the Pocona process, which um, seems like an awful lot of effort um, for reducing an already fairly short downtime window. Um, so we didn't pursue that option. After the cutover, you can re-enable Puppet, make sure Pacemaker is managing everything. You have, um, we have reasonable monitoring for Pacemaker, so we can just look at Narjus and say, yes, Pacemaker seems good. Um, then you resize the file system so that it expands into the area previously used for the, in the old clusters metadata. So if you recall this diagram, that red metadata is no longer being used once you're off cluster one. It's just been replicated across and forgotten about. So you just resize to FS that, and then it's like it never existed. Okay, looking at what this method um, gave us, 
um, it worked well for this specific use case due to the unusual constraints of a very large volume of data with um, enough I.O. activity that we couldn't use Pocono's built-in replication. In fact, if we had, even if we had been able to use Pocono's built-in replication, it's worth noting that the downtime wouldn't have been reduced because you have to restart Pocono to enable binary logging anyway. Um, so you just would have had that downtime before, a while before the cutover instead of at the cutover. Um, An incremental rsync would actually take even longer because it has to read through all the files and make sure that um, nothing has changed because Pocono stores its data in um, huge um, blobby files as relational databases tend to do. Um, and rsync doesn't know how to um, introspect those, it just treats them as binary. Um, so what we, did, what we achieved through this was 10 minutes of downtime for a three terabyte data set by syncing at the block level rather than um, the application or the file system level. I will say that for most use cases, this method is unnecessarily complex. Um, most of the time you're going to be able to use something like Pocono replication or rsync or something along, along those lines and doing a block level sync is just over the top. Um, if you're using something that's, that doesn't have its own replication um, built in and for whatever reason you can't use rsync or some similar method, um, then this might be interesting to you. And to, just wanted to finish drawing some conclusions from, um, from our experiences with this. Um, the RBD manages to be incredibly flexible due to the fact that it's designed to integrate into the Linux I.O. stack. It's effectively um, a component like any other component like LVM or anything, and you can piece it together to do whatever you want. Um, it makes it useful outside of HA clustering. It's mainly used for replication for high availability, but in this case we've used it as a data transport um, to get data from one place to another. Um, but naturally every use case is going to be different and um, the, that's one of the great things about the modularity of Unix in general and DRBD just fits into that Unix philosophy that we all know and love. So there are some links. The first one is my employer, Anchor, we do managed hosting. And the second link is the DLBD user's guide, which contains a lot of very useful information and you can work out how to do a lot of cool things like this just from reading through the user's guide. So I would recommend doing that if you use DRBD and haven't read through it. Um, and that was all I had and I appear to be um, about right on time. So are there any questions? Um, it was a, around two or three days, I think. I don't remember um, the, the, the specifics, um, and I don't recall what it was bound by either. Um, but we wanted, we didn't want to just let it um, do um, do its thing on the network unchecked because the um, the the RBD traffic between the clusters was using the same network link as the um, intra cluster DRBD. Um, so we didn't want to let the initial sync from one cluster to another go nuts and then slow down the traffic that we actually care about for production. Yeah, worse yet, you can actually, you can actually get, get it, where it where it hangs if you do that kind of thing, if you, if you start with a bandwidth, you know, good plan. Did it say we have a throttle at the end the DRBD syncing to achieve that? Uh, how did you achieve um, that? Yes, okay, sorry, I'm, I've been forgetting to repeat the questions again. The first question was, um, how long the initial sync took. Um, this newer question is um, if you're able to throttle the DRBD sync. Um, I believe that's actually an option in the DRBD config, so you can set a default um, throttle so that it won't go nuts on you as soon as you start the sync, and you can also manually set it um, so you can raise or lower it or whatever for your needs um, later on. So it's built into DRBD that it can do that. Yeah? Which I, as I appreciate the, the kind words you said about the stacking stuff that I wrote in there about four years ago, so why it's so useful. Uh, I do have uh, some concerns about the setup that you presented. Um, if you have a three terabyte data set and it takes you uh, 10 minutes to gracefully shut it down, 
um, then I don't know your, your InnoDB uh, transaction log or, or buffer pool settings, but I'm guessing that on an actual failover that is near the eBase, you're probably going to run through an InnoDB crash recovery that is much longer than that. So I don't know your SLA here, uh, but if that takes you something like 30 or 45 minutes, that's probably not going to make your customers happy. Uh, which is why I'm asking, did you at any point for this specific migration uh, consider going to uh, XDB cluster instead rather than VRM? Basically, cut over, like on your original cluster, uh, on, this, on the secondary, uh, install the XDB cluster binaries instead of the standard Bitcoin server binaries, cut over to that because they're binary compatible, and then add additional nodes to that cluster, including the ones that you. Uh, that you bring up, use an, 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 an SST based on extra backup or whatever, so you don't block on that on that new master. Is that something that you considered? Um, okay, so the question was if we considered moving to um, using extra DB cluster rather than Percona um, due to the ten minute time it takes to um, shut down and restart to shut down and start up Percona. Um, that's not something that we considered at the time, partly because. Um, we were approaching the capacity of the cluster um, fast enough that the objective was get it onto new machines with more storage and extra DB is not something we have a good deal of um, experience working with. So we wanted to go with something we knew worked. Um, yes, if we'd had um, a little bit more time when planning it, that might have been something we'd considered, but no, um, in this particular case, it's not something that we'd considered, no. Have you run crash recovery tests on the new hardware sites? that data set and specifically with that traffic to the site? Um, so in other words, do you know what your actual hard failover time is? Uh, okay, was the, the question was if we know what the hard failover time is, if we've run tests on it. Um, I haven't myself. Um, I um, also didn't, um, after finishing this migration, I was working on other projects, so it's um, entirely possible that somebody else, whoever picked this up, has gone and done that. But um, personally, I, I haven't myself, no. Yeah. What was the underlying storage? Was an LVM logical volume? Um, yes, um, LVM on top of. Uh, yep. the, the question was what's the underlying storage in LVM logical volume? Uh, yes. So, how does DRV deal with that? Having its underlying storage slides re changed, uh, resized, is that that's something that it's coped with? Um, in this particular case, um, the storage wasn't resized for a single DRBD resource. We had two differently sized resources. But yes, DRBD will let you um, resize the underlying storage, um, and then you just do a, a DRBD ADM resize to move the metadata to the new location. Any more questions, guys? We've got a good, a good five minutes. If anyone's got any more? Yeah. I'll, just, I'll throw in one that's um, half question, half statement. I noticed that you said that you tested all this on a, another cluster and I went through some similar things before and there's often a lot of pushback from the people of purse strings when you say, hey, we've got two clusters and I want you to spend the money on another two clusters so that I can properly test the whole thing. But, but we found that really invaluable and uh, so I was going to say, uh, Glad you went that way, and uh, so I think that's something you should really push for as a technical person. Otherwise, you'll just end up wearing it all. Okay, um, I'm, so I'll, I'll just repeat what was said. The um, the comment was that it w it was a good idea to test on um, a separate cluster before doing this in production. Um, well, all, I, all of the point is it's kind of a bit of an ask when you say I want to replicate the cluster failover because there's a lot of resources. Storage, set of storage systems, another set of I'll, I'll explain more clearly what I did. Um, I, effectively, be, because of what I wanted to test was um, this process um, to make sure that the process itself was sane um, without really caring about the specifics of the data being replicated. Um, I just did that on a few throwaway VMs. So it was actually a fairly cheap process to spin up the VMs, um, install Pocona and DRBD and whatnot, and then try this out. Um, so if, if it had been a more involved procedure where it made more of a difference what was being replicated, um, then yes, that would have been a bit um, more difficult to, to accomplish. But given that I could just do it on a few VMs, that was fairly straightforward.
questions? No. Okay, we'd like to uh, thank Stephen on behalf of the OCA team. Thank you.